grands spécialistes. Merci. Bonjour. Thank you very much, uh, Michel. I, I, I'm, I'm very happy I couldn't understand anything you said now because uh, probably we we're highly exaggerating, but okay, let's, uh, let's accept that. Uh, so, so I'm going to talk about cannabis. And uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to thank uh, the organizers, especially Jean-Pierre, very much that I'm allowed to be here again. And uh, I hope next time you will invite me again because uh, this morning I, I noticed that in the talk of uh, uh, even Montoya, we didn't talk, he didn't talk about uh, uh, substitution treatment uh, with stimulants. And I think that was something that, that needs to be discussed uh, some other time. Uh, so today I would like to talk a little bit about cannabis and, cannabis and, and it, it has a pretty heavy title, Ethics and the Law. And I'm not an ethicist and I'm not a, not a lawyer, so I have to be very modest in that. But you will see I will take a quite practical approach to that. But before doing so, I, I of course have to uh, give my disclosures. Not that any of these disclosures have to do anything with the, the talk that I'm going to, to give now. So, but I think it's good that I, uh, I show my disclosures. So what I would like to talk a little bit about is very briefly to give some definitions of ethics and, and, and the law, because uh, I think there, there is some, some confusion there, and I will give you my perspective on that. And then I will talk about uh, how we can look at, um, at the current situation in, in the world with regard to the uh, prohibition and the uh, uh, normalization and legalization of, of cannabis use and. Uh, and how we can look at that. And, and of course, whenever you talk about that, you have to talk about uh, will uh, having a more liberal view on cannabis, uh, will, not, will it not increase uh, uh, prevalence rates? Uh, will we not have massive amounts of cannabis dependent people? Will we not have a dramatic increase in, in patients with schizophrenia due to the cannabis use? And of course, what is going to happen with all these cannabis uses? Will there not be massive cognitive damage? And uh, we need answers to these questions. And, and I will give you some, some selection of the literature to, to maybe inform our decision on the ethical and, and legal issues. So before starting to review the literature, uh, first, I, I think we have to think about what we mean when we talk about ethics. And, and when you talk about ethics, and I'm just, this is Wikipedia science, because this is not my field of, uh, of research, but uh, it basically, ethics is, uh, it involves systematizing and defending and recommending concepts of right and wrong behavior. And, and, and if you look at uh, the, the theory on it, it's basically divided in uh, three areas. Uh, you have the meta-ethics, and that's really for, for really smart people. And, and that's about the consideration about the origins and meaning of ethical principles. So that is very close to philosophy, and I'm pretty far away from philosophy. Then you come to what they call normative ethics, and that's basically a little closer. It's the identification of moral standards regulating, not defining, but regulating what is right and wrong in, in behaviors. And finally, there is an area that is very applied, applied ethics, and that is really the practical application of ethics in very specific cases, almost in NS1 cases. So I think I feel most comfortable in the area of normative ethics. And if you think about normative ethics, then again, they make distinction between two ways of looking at ethics. One is the, what they call the deontological ethics. And it's looking actually ethics in a way thinking about more of intentions and actions are more important than the final outcome, the goals and the outcomes. Whereas there's also something that is called consequential ethics, and that is we're not looking so much as intentions, which, which my mother probably did, they looked at my intentions, but then my behaviors weren't always in, in accordance with that. And so I'm looking more from the consequential part of ethics, is looking at outcomes and actions as the basis of our moral evaluation. So if you think where I come from, my approach here is a normative, consequential way of looking at ethics. You also have to think that in terms of the law, because if you think about prohibition and, and legalization, then we're talking about the law, not only about ethics. 
then generally there is two kinds of law being distinguished. One is what is called the malum in se, and that is some kind of Latin words, and it means that it's about the evil itself, what is bad in itself. And basically this is involving violence and, 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 and murders and these kind of very serious uh, uh, violations of rules. And, and most of the time, these kinds of laws, they're very consistent over the world almost. They call it jurisdictions. And, and these laws are generally very stable and not very controversial. Then there is other area of laws, and what they call malum prohibitum. Not fundamentally wrong, maybe, but it's, it's forbidden, and there's reasons for, for, for forbidding it. And it's law mainly involving consensual and nonviolent activities. And, and these laws, they, they differ by country and by area. So it's most of the time not very consistent over time. Uh, it's uh, unstable and often very controversial. So if we talk about the ethics and the law in, in cannabis, I think uh, I take here the, the it's not, it's, it's a problem, but it's not uh, a series of, of, of crime that has death penalty. So it's probably something like the malum probitum. So I take the consequential ethics approach on a malum prohibitum behavior. That is my approach. And I wrote it down once in, in more regular terms in a, in a paper in, from 2008. And it basically, it, my position would be that in a modern secular society, it should be taken for granted that the state should respect personal choices as much as possible and refrain from unnecessary infringements on the individual liberty even if this is not always in the best interest of a person involved. So people are allowed to do bad things. At the same time, it is acknowledged that the state has a clear responsibility to promote the health of its citizens and to protect them from unnecessary health and other risks, especially for minors who deserve our protection. And I'll come back to that later. To do so, the state can promulgate laws and regulations with the obligation, and that's very important, to enforce them in a similar way on all citizens. And in the development and enforcement of these laws and regulations, the state should always act in a similar way to similar situations. So that, that is a very important thing. You want the law to act rationally and similar to similar situations. So this is my starting point. I'll take a consequential ethics approach on a malo prohibitum behavior and see what the consequences are for thinking about uh, questions that I would like to answer today. So if you think about laws, then the first thing would be, the question would be, does decriminalization lead to more cannabis use? If that's dramatic, then maybe the law should do something. And if so, does it lead to more and more serious individual and public health problems. For example, will it lead to much more cannabis dependence or other drug addictions? Would it lead to an increase of schizophrenia and will it produce massive uh, destruction of our youngsters' brains in terms of an, an increase of cognitive deficits? And if so, are minors more vulnerable than adult people because maybe minors need our protection? It could also be that, that criminalization, not the decriminal, but the criminalization causes extra problems. So including more dangerous cannabis-like substances, things like spice, other addictions, and, and incarcerations. So I think we should try not to choose the one or the other, but try to develop a balance between the two. So at the end of my talk, I hope that I give you a kind of a, a net result, a net effect of that discussion. So let's think about whether uh, similar behaviors are treated in a similar way. This is just uh, data on, on from, from uh, Louisa Dakenhart and, uh, and uh, Dr. Hall from Australia and looking at the situation of uh, drug use in the world. And then you see that uh, there's a lot of people who use tobacco and it's quite uh, 1.6 billion people uh, dependent on tobacco and uh, tobacco kills about six million people every year. Uh, in terms of alcohol, there's uh, about three billion people using it and about 76 million people uh, 
being dependent on it. And if you talk about cannabis, uh, it's big numbers, but comparatively it's small numbers, 200 million users and 25 million people with abuse or dependence. Now, the green is in green because these people are able to use their drugs in a legal way and quality controls. And the, the, actually the distribution is facilitated by governments. Now compared to that, the ones in red, the cannabis users, in most countries, these consumers are using an illegal produced, non-quality controlled substance obtained by illegal purchases and in many countries, trade, possession, and consumption will lead and often does to incarceration. So now, if the damage is similar to these uh, drugs, then maybe this is not, the law is not treating similar behaviors in a similar way. Um, that would be maybe an, an ethical situation. Now, you have to think, what are the consequences if you start to think about uh, decriminalization? So this is just a picture from, uh, from uh, the WHO uh, and looking at um, uh, cannabis worldwide. And so you see that the legal situation is, uh, is quite different uh, uh, within Europe and within the world. There's uh, a few countries where uh, cannabis use is legal, the Netherlands, Uruguay, the USA, until recently, that was a completely different situation. Oregon, for example, and Colorado, Colorado, and for some reason, Bangladesh and North Korea. Other countries have different levels of criminalization. Now, you would think that the places where cannabis is illegal, there there is low prevalence rates, and where it's uh, not legal, where it's decriminalized or legalized, the rates which were much uh, higher. Now, I'm, I'm not going one by one, but you can easily see that this is not the case. And to be more precise, uh, the, a lot of analysis have been made, but there is no clear relationship between the level of decriminalization and the level of cannabis use in the different countries. Getting a little closer, looking in Europe, looking at uh, lifetime uh, prevalence of cannabis use in, uh, in youngsters, uh, this is data from the EMCDDA from 2013, and you see the different cannabis use levels in the different European countries. And you can see very quickly that the countries with the, uh, uh, the most strict law, they sometimes have very high levels of cannabis use, such as France. And sometimes these countries have very low cannabis use levels, such as uh, Sweden. Doesn't look like a real lawful relationship. And then there's this crazy country, the Netherlands, with a liberal law, and they're somewhere in between. In short, there is no clear relationship between uh, the legal situation and the number of cannabis users in a country. And actually, it's even more interesting now what's going on in the US. Uh, there's, there has been some observers being made between the changes in, in some of the states, and so far, but we have to be very careful, it's only in its very early stages, it seems there's no causal relationship between changes in legal situation in certain states and changes in cannabis use prevalence. So I think it's very safe to conclude that decriminalization is not related and probably not causally related to increases in cannabis use, which is an important thing to realize. Now, even if it's not increasing dramatically, but even if there is still a small risk, then you want to know what consequences it might have. And some people say there will be a dramatic increase in cannabis dependence. And again, we have to treat similar behaviors in a similar way in order to be ethical. And so this is some early data from 1994 showing uh, that if a person is using a substance once in his life, what is the probability that he becomes dependent on that substance. And, and this was data from the, uh, the National Comorbidity Study at that time. And you see, if you once use tobacco in your life, you have about 30% probability that you become dependent on tobacco. If you once used heroin in your life, you might think that there's 100% probability, but it's not. Then it's about 24% 24, 24 
23% to be exact, that, that you become a heroin-dependent person. With, uh, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, alcohol, it's 15%. And here is cannabis, 9%. So cannabis, if you use it once in your life, the probability that you become dependent is actually, I don't say it's negligible, but it's pretty low. There's some more recent studies here, and, and this is also study from the National Comorbidity Study, but it's a little more recent, 2002. And here you see the development of uh, the risk that you become coke independent, the risk that you become alcohol dependent. Here is the risk that you become cannabis dependent. See, again, much lower. And this is the most recent data from the NISARC, from a big American study. Uh, this is data from 2011, I think. And here you see, if you are once in your life use nicotine, nowadays, now the overall use went down, actually the probability that you become addicted is about 67%. Whereas for alcohol and cocaine, it's about 20%. And here, cannabis, it's still 9%. So cannabis is the least likely drug that you will become dependent on once you start to use it. Now, what defines whether you move from cannabis use to cannabis dependence? And actually, there is not a lot of data about that. Definitely not, not from the general populations. Uh, first of all, we have to recognize that moving from, like starting to use cannabis is basically socially determined. That's what we know from twin studies. But whether you move from use to dependence, it's very highly genetically determined. We also know now that the amount and frequency of use is not actually predictive of being becoming dependent. It's also not so interesting whether the concentration of THC is very high. Uh, there's two things that actually are predictive of becoming dependent, and one is coping style, and the other one is internalizing disorders, anxiety, and depression. So again, if you want to prevent cannabis dependence, it shouldn't do universal prevention, like to try to prevent any use. You should pre pre try to prevent the movement from use to dependence. And then I think universal prevention is not the way to go. You have to go to uh, prevention uh, on, um, on uh, uh, selective or, or indicated prevention. And so we have to look at school kids with ADHD and with depression. And, and we have to do something. And of course, we will run into some people with, uh, with cannabis uh, dependence, but fortunately we have some, some good psychological and some pharmacological treatments available now. So I'm not saying that cannabis dependence is not a problem. This is showing that. In Europe, we have about 60,000 people now that are in, uh, in, in treatment. And it's, it's actually, it was increasing in the last few years. I'm not saying that cannabis dependence is increasing, but more treatments make themselves available to young users. Now, this has been a very important issue. Cannabis is causing schizophrenia, according to some people. And, and many people have said, we have to close the coffee shops in the Netherlands because you're producing schizophrenics. And of course, these were serious people. They were people who were professors of psychiatry, especially what I would call schizophrenologists. And uh, they were very serious in this issue. And so th there are quite a lot of studies done. Of course, there's no randomized control trials, but there is prospective studies. And they were very nicely summarized some years ago by Theresa Moore uh, in The Lancet. And you see, uh, if you use cannabis, the probability that you become psychotic is 40% higher. Now, you might not worry about it. But this was another number. If you become a frequent cannabis user, your risk to become psychotic in the future is 100% higher. Odds ratio is two. So that's a serious risk. Now, you have to realize these were all naturalistic studies, and there's a lot of confounders involved there. And actually, they looked at these studies, and depending on what kind of confounders were taken into account, the risk went down with 10 to sometimes 80%, and you will know for sure that not all confounders were taken into account. There will still be residual con confounding. This is a very recent study. It was, uh, what is it, 2014. One of these residual confounders is maybe people who kind of use, start to use cannabis, they already had from birth on already a bigger risk that they would become psychotic. 
This is a very interesting study in, uh, in molecular psychiatry. It's not, not a wishy-washy journal, it's molecular psychiatry. And it shows that actually cannabis users have more uh, schizophrenia, schizophrenogenic genes. We know now that there's about 108 genes that are related to schizophrenia. If you look at these genes, then people with these genes have a higher probability that they start to use cannabis. They also, of course, have a higher probability that they start to use, uh, that they become schizophrenic. So we thought that this was the relation. Cannabis is causing schizophrenia. Now it looks more that schizophrenia genes are causing both cannabis use and schizophrenia. And there is no causal relationship here. This is actually a spurious relationship. It's confounding. That's not the whole story. These genes are responsible only for 4 to 5% of the risk of schizophrenia. But this is one of the important additional confounding factors. And there will be many more. So at the end, maybe the odds ratio is not 2. Maybe it's 1.4, 1.5. Maybe it's 1.1. But it's much smaller than the 2 that I mentioned before. Now, we knew that already, of course, because the increase of cannabis use since the 1960s is dramatic. And if cannabis use would cause schizophrenia, we would have an increase in the incidence of schizophrenia. And Louisa Dakenhart wrote a nice paper on that. There is no indication that there is a worldwide increase or a European increase in schizophrenia. If anything, there is some indication that incidence of schizophrenia is stable going down a little bit. So there is not a lot of reason. But then, then there was this important paper from, uh, from uh, New Zealand. The paper of uh, Ashfalom Kaspi from 2005 in biological psychiatry, uh, following up a, a birth cohort uh, of about 1,000 uh, young people up to, I think, age 30, and, and looking at uh, uh, the development of schizophrenia in, patient, in people who are using cannabis, and especially taking into to account the, the uh, effect of difference in the COM gene. The idea, of course, was always that cannabis is causing schizophrenia because cannabis is releasing dopamine. And the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia tells us that there is more dopamine produced, there is a higher probability that you become schizophrenic or psychotic. And they said, maybe it's especially in those that have a special variation of the COMT gene where there is even a reduced metabolizing of, uh, of dopamine. And so, these people will be at the highest risk. And see what happens. It, it happens. People who had the COM gene, the Valvel variation of the COM gene, had a much higher risk score if they started to use cannabis at a young age than the ones that had actually the met met variation of the gene. And you see it in all kinds of different aspects of psychosis. Youngsters that started to use cannabis at a young age, before age 18, and had the wrong variation of the COM gene, they were getting more often psychotic. And so they said, you see, cannabis is causing schizophrenia through the mechanism of dopamine release. Now, I must say, I, I talked to, uh, you, see, you see her here, uh, here is Terry Moffat. She was the second author of the paper. So I talked to Terry Moffat and I asked, this is an important finding. She said, no, 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 wait, wait. She says, it's very interesting findings, but the findings have no public health relevance. Why did she say that? She says, we're reporting odds ratios, but if you want to see what the effect is on the population, you're not, you shouldn't use odds ratios. You should use population attributable risk. So if you have an odds ratio of two, and this effect is 100% causal, which is very unlikely. But if you have that, the population attributable risk for schizophrenia is only 5 or 10%. So even with this high odds ratio, the probability that people become schizophrenic because they use cannabis is very small. So it also means that you have to dramatically reduce the cannabis use in order to prevent any case of schizophrenia. Now, I was, I was kind of, okay, let's see. But then there was another study on the COM gene, and it didn't replicate the findings of, uh, of Caspi. Then there was another study of Costas. They found opposite relationship between 
the, uh, the comms variations. Uh, then was a study of Hanket. She supported the findings on the COM gene, but she said only in liable patients, people with family history of, of uh, schizophrenia or psychosis. So again, doubting the question whether it's really causal. And then finally, I saw this paper of David Nutt in uh, Nature Neuroscience Review. Oh, it's here. And what did I see? If people use cannabis, if people use all kinds of drugs, like uh, here you see, uh, uh, the, the, the amphetamine, here you see uh, nicotine, here you see cannabis. Cannabis is almost not producing dopamine. It's doing something, but it's not producing a lot of dopamine. So I think this whole dopamine hypothesis, the relationship, the causal relation between cannabis and schizophrenia, I think there's not much left of that. Okay, but then there's another thing. Maybe there is not a high risk of dependence. Maybe there's no reason to think that people become schizophrenic from cannabis use. But what about cognitive deficits? There is, there is quite a lot of studies done there. And uh, I think we get some more today. And I, I will try to, to prime you to be critical on these studies. This is a study that uh, a review uh, in, in probably the best journal of, of reviews, neuroscience and biobehavioral reviews, done by an excellent researcher from originally Spain, but he's living now in, uh, in Australia, Antonio Verdeja Cartilla. And uh, he did a review on the literature, and this was the conclusion. You can read it here, it's not, I didn't make it up. He says, uh, uh, with regard to the relationship between cannabis use and sustained cognitive deficits, he said, there's not enough data for final conclusions, but only episodic memory and planning deficit seems to persist at midterm cannabis use, but no effects are observable at long-term abstinence. Now, that's only one person. I, I, I actually looked only at, at studies that, that can tell you something about it. You need actually studies that are prospective and start to look at cognitive deficits with measurement of the cognitive capacities of people before they started using cannabis. And actually, there's only two of these. Out of this whole review, there's only two. This is the most famous one until recently from Freed in 2005. Uh, they were looking at, uh, at a group of uh, people that they started to, uh, to measure at the age of 12. And then they, uh, they looked at, again at them at the age of 18. And they had a group of healthy controls. They never used any cannabis. They had a group of light users and they used 122 joints ever in their life. Then had a group of current heavy users, and they were using almost 2,000 uh, joints uh, in their life. Then they had a group of former heavy users, and these were abstinent for uh, at least a few months. And they used even more, more than 2,000 joints lifetime. And so they started to compare these people on memory, IQ, vocabulary, and abstract reasoning. And what you see is, the healthy controls are actually very similar to the former heavy users. There's no differences there. There is a high, very big difference for current heavy users. Current heavy users, they have cognitive deficits. Of course, that's what they're going for. That's what they have. But if they stop for a few months, you see they have normal cognitive functioning. That was for a long time the only study. Then there was this study, and people say, okay, now we have the final conclusive answer. This was again from the Dunedin study from New Zealand. And uh, they, they had a birth cohort again, uh, following them up from uh, age two or three till 38. They were assessed IQ at age 13 and at age 38, and they looked at cannabis use and dependence at ages 18, 21, 26, 23, 32, and 38. So they looked at a lot of uh, confounders, and this is what they found. If you had in this period between age 13 and age 30, you had three episodes where you had a positive diagnosis of, alcohol, of cannabis dependence, or you used regularly uh, uh, at three or more of these assessments until the age of 30, you see that the IQ was lower in this group, and the effect size was 0.3. 30.40, which is small to moderate. It's, uh, it, it's agrees with about five, six IQ points, which who wants to lose five, six IQ points? I, I wouldn't like to use I six. Uh, I lost a few on the way probably by growing up, but maybe it's not what you want. 
So I start to look at this data, and there was at least one thing. I think in their press release they said people who use cannabis at a young age, they lose eight points. That is indeed true. Actually, it's only six. But then you have to look at the ones that were still using cannabis in the last week. That's not serious. You don't look at that. I think you should only look at the ones that stopped using already for a while to see the sustained cognitive effects. And so if you looked at the sustained cognitive effects, only in these persons that at least for the last uh, week were not using cannabis anymore, you see the number of IQ points that they lose was a little less. It's only three to four. It's, uh, the effect size is then lower than 0.30. And so you see the effect size become re really small. Now, it's very clear that if you start to use cannabis at a later age, after age 18, whatever and how long you use, there's no effect on your cognition. There might be an effect on your cognition if you start to use cannabis very early. And now, it's very questionable what it is, whether it's the fact that you're not following school, they checked for that and they couldn't find a reason. But anyway, we have to realize that this group that is having three plus diagnosis and started at an early age is representing only 2% of the population. So in general, I would say even this study doesn't show very clearly that cannabis leads to serious cognitive deficits. Now people say, but you see, there were very big difference in, in, in brain structure. People who used cannabis and people who didn't use cannabis, and this is a famous study for, from Murat Yutzel from, from Australia published in the archives of general psychiatry. And he said, uh, look at people who were actually using cannabis. Look at their hippocampus and their amygdala. And what you see then is that uh, the people who use cannabis, uh, they have much smaller hippocampus than the ones who don't, uh, both le left and right, and they have a smaller amygdala. That's the dramatic finding. Look at the patients that he saw, the people that he saw. They were age 40 on average. How many cannabis users do you know at age 40? These people started actually, they, they were smoking cannabis for 20 years on 28 days per month. They used 212 joints per month. And cumulative use, they used 61,000 joints. These are idiots to start with, isn't it? And idiots have abnormal brains. That's actually what he showed, I think. So I think there is no proof there is any causality there. These people probably were strange people to start with, and that's what you show in their brains. Now, you can say the hippocampus is also smaller in youngsters with alcohol use disorders, because similar findings, and here you see it, uh, heavy uh, alcohol use is youngsters, they have a smaller hippocampus, and you can see it. This is a smaller hippocampus than here. So maybe, maybe it's, it is damaging the brain. But then there was this study, a study from, uh, from India, and they were actually showing that indeed it might be happening, but they looked at children of alcoholic parents who didn't use alcohol themselves, and they also had a smaller hippocampus, which makes you start thinking that having a small hippocampus is a risk factor to start using cannabis or a risk factor to start using uh, alcohol, but it's not a consequence. We started to look at, uh, at adults uh, with uh, alcohol use uh, in their family and uh, we looked at, the, at their hippocampus, and what you see is uh, the people with, uh, and they were not alcohol users, heavy alcohol users themselves. And you see the non-alcohol users with the family history that was positive for alcohol had a smaller hippocampus. So I think there's strong proof now that the small hippocampus is not a consequence of alcohol or, 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 or cannabis use. It's probably a precursor. It's probably a risk factor. Now, this is what we know from the consequences. Now, there is also, and, and what may happen or may not happen if you start to decriminalize. Now, is there also other costs to criminalization? This is data from the Netherlands, and I always think that we're reasonable and that we, 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 we actually uh, liberalized and, and we depenalized cannabis, and so we have the coffee shops, and I think maybe we stop the war on drugs which we didn't. Meanwhile, the Netherlands is spending about 75% of all the money on law enforcement related to cannabis because we have to deal with the international laws. And we only spend very little money on prevention, treatment, and harm reduction. 
So even the Netherlands, we're doing stupid things. We, we don't believe that cannabis is so detrimental. But still, we spend most of our money, our taxpayers' money, on law enforcement. So that's what happens. If you criminalize cannabis, I think we don't see any spice on the market because there is no need for spice on the market because there is cannabis, there is good cannabis available in the coffee shop. So actually you see no, no spice. I think if you keep cannabis illegal, and we see it also with other drugs, then there is a bigger market for uh, uh, alternative synthetic cannabis forms. And so there's many uh, being produced and there are places where it gets on the market. In general, these are full agonists of the THC. And there's no CBD, no cannabidiol there. So in fact, this is the more dangerous kind of, uh, of cannabis that we have. And so that's what you see. There's some, some reviews written about the risk of uh, spice compared to uh, cannabis. We wrote a, a review ourselves recently. And so it's a risk if you move from cannabis to the other thing, the more illegal situation that will promote that if you go to spice, that you will have more seizures, more cardiovascular symptoms, more kidney injury, and maybe also more psychosis. So giving space to alternative producers producing spice might have a negative downside. So in summary, looking at uh, what, what I showed you is that uh, the risk to develop cannabis dependence is probably between eight and 10%. The causes are very complex. I think universal prevention of cannabis use is not very useful there, and we should start to look at selective and indicated prevention of cannabis use disorders. And we should, of course, try to treat cannabis use disorder. The association between cannabis and schizophrenia is definitely there, but the causal direction is unknown. And I think the effect size at the end is very small. Cannabis use prevention will have a negligible effect in terms of the numbers needed to prevent in the prevention of schizophrenia. Don't believe anything of it. Unlikely that cannabis use will lead to sustained cognitive deficits. I emphasize the sustained. But damage in young adolescents cannot be fully excluded. So we have to be careful. So I think we shouldn't go for no uh, uh, for, for legalization, we should go for regulation. There is something to protect there on, in our youngsters, so we have to be careful. Prohibition is probably associated with organized crime, low quality cannabis, development of dangerous variations of, uh, uh, of spice, contact with the criminal peers, spending public money on policy, policing, and a loss of credibility of the legal system. So thinking about what is the situation with, uh, with cannabis now, we, not so long ago, we, we tried to, to make an, uh, a, rank, a ranking of dangers and, and, and harms of alcohol, tobacco, and, and other illicit drugs. In, in our evaluation of experts, you see that cocaine, heroin, tobacco, and alcohol, these are, with our view, the dangerous drugs. And cannabis is a ranking actually quite low. And still, people who use these drugs have nothing to fear from, from the, the law, and these ones do. You might say, this is that, the, the Dutch idiots. It's not. This is the same study was done in the UK by David Nutt and his group. And you see, this is the correlation between the ratings, the rankings between the UK experts and the Dutch experts. And they agreed very, very much. There is something very interesting here. Here's the hard drugs, here's the soft drug cannabis. Here's another hard drug, and it's ecstasy, and I want to say one, one or two words. Ecstasy is, is, is a drug that is quite common now, but there is another drug available in the world, and that's what is called equacy. Who, who, who heard about equacy in his life? Ambrose heard about equacy. I, I'll tell you what the drug is. This is a case report, and then I'll come to the, the meaning of what it is. So. So what was her addiction? It's a case report among a woman who was addicted to equacy. What was her addiction? What is equacy? It is an addiction that produces the release of adrenaline and endorphins and which is used by many millions of people in the UK, including children and young people. My God. The harmful consequences are well established. About 10 people a year die of it and many more suffer permanent neurological damage as had my patient. 
It has been estimated that there is a serious adverse event every 350 exposures, and these are unpredictable, though more likely in experienced users who take more risk with accuracy. It is also associated with over, more, with over 100 road traffic accidents per year, often with deaths. Equity leads to gatherings of users that, are, that often are associated with these groups engaging in violent conduct. Dependence is defined by the need to continue to use, has been accepted by the courts in the divorce, divorce settlements. Based on these harms, it seems likely that the regulation authority in, in the UK would recommend control over the MD Act, the Opium Act, perhaps as a class A drug, given it appears more harmful than ecstasy. So this is a dangerous drug, isn't it? So now I tell you what the drug is. It's recreational horse riding. If you do recreational horse riding, you have big risk that you become dependent on that and that you will develop neurological damage from it. Very high risks. Now the question is, should we make horse riding illegal? Or should we start to regulate ecstasy if we want to do similar things to similar behaviors? So what are my conclusions? These were the questions that I raised a minute ago. Does criminalization lead to more cannabis use? The answer is no, or maybe probably no. But even if, does it lead to more and serious individual public health problems, including cannabis dependence? Uh, probably not more, because in, in, there is not an increase in, in cannabis use, so probably it's not increasing cannabis dependable, dependence but we cannot exclude it completely. And anyway, it seems to become more and more treatable. Is there a probability that schizophrenia incident is going up? I would say it's a clear no. Sustained cognitive deficits? I think it's very likely not, but we have to be careful with our kids. Are minors more vulnerable and in need of protection? Maybe minors are in need of our protection. So regulation is probably better than total legalization, as is going on now in in some states in the US, like in Colorado. Does criminalization lead to extra problems? Yes, it does. It gives space, space for spice, and spice is probably more dangerous than cannabis. It leads to organized crime and incarceration. So my question was, what is the net effect of the different strategies? I would say decriminalization, the net effect. I'm not saying it's good in all sides, but the net effect is clearly positive, and in terms of prohibition, the net effect, net effect is clearly negative. So, in this, pa this paper that I wrote in 2008, uh, I actually came to the conclusion that the law is actually unethical. It doesn't treat similar behaviors in a similar way as you may expect from a decent government. Now, with the decriminalization in Europe, more and more, France, we'll have to see how it is in France, decriminalization in the USA and decriminalization in Uruguay, I think the law in many places is getting more ethical. And here I will end my talk. Thank you.